Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. What a delightful time to be growing. We're coming to you this week from one of Sydney's most beloved historic gardens, Forclues House. Famed for its beautiful garden-esque plantings, picturesque kitchen garden and its stunning harbour outlook. It's almost as inspiring as the outlook we have for you on this week's show. Here's what's coming up. I'm on edge today, and you'll be on the edge of your seats too with some cheap and cheerful ways of creating wonderful edging for your garden. I'm in the Perth Hills to see how growing fruit and vegetables can be part of the good life. And I'll be picking up some tips on growing berries and avocados as well. And we head north, far north, to meet a curious plant collector in Cairns. The dream is to construct a huge Jurassic theme. There's so many plants that put their best flower forward at this time of the year. None more so than the rhododendrons. They're big, they're bold, they're beautiful, and Jane's found the perfect place to get amongst them. The Dandenong Ranges Botanic Gardens is in the hills beyond Melbourne. This is a fantastic example of a cool climate garden, and it's stunning in every season. On some of the higher vantage points, there are views of the surrounding valleys and mountains. Other vistas are framed by the towering mountain ash, the tallest flowering plant in the world. But the garden's main draw card is its massive collection of over 25,000 rhododendrons and azaleas. And it's spring when you really should come to see them in action. Absolutely magnificent. The slopes are alive with vibrant colour. The garden was previously called the National Rhododendron Garden and it was established by the Australian Rhododendron Society in the 1960s. And while it's now thriving, Ranger Terence Moon, who's known Tex is taking me around the huge 40 hectare garden. What is it about rhododendrons and azaleas that people so love? It's the wow factor. It's the, they're big, they're showy, they're colourful. And I think that when you dig a bit deeper, it's the diversity of the, of the genus. You know, it really is a large, complex mm. and rich genus of plants with, you know, trees that can be up to 30 metres tall right down to small, yeah. smallest alpine shrub. Amazing, and then yeah. you've got the epiphytes as well. And that's right, epiphytic rhododendrons that, that cling on to tree trunks and, and tree fern trunks to, for survival. Amazingly diverse. Very diverse. The Australian breeders of rhododendrons need some credit, don't they? They certainly do. They've created some great hybrids that work well in our conditions. There's my snow white, which is a small compact white flowering rhododendron. There's wonder that's a beautiful pink large trusses of flowers and then there's this one which is actually called freckle pink and why did they breed them what was the purpose so you can imagine that the early hybrids that came to australia were, were bred for european conditions so so they tended to flower later in spring to avoid frosts and snowfalls whereas in australia we have hot summers and so we needed them to to flower earlier to actually give them a longer season before the summer scorch would hit them yeah, and that's what they've done. And that's exactly Early what they've flowering. done. Early yeah. flowering. And look at the bees, they love it. They love it, yeah. yeah. It's another factor that people don't really recognise about rhododendrons. Many of them are fragrant. They are. Yeah, yeah. And this one, this one in particular. It's a beautiful smell. It is. And you can sort of smell it from about a metre away too. It's always nice to have that. Yes, uh, yes, it's a surprise as you're walking past. That is a stunning thing though, isn't it? A mountain of white with a little yeah. bit of cream. Beautiful. I can remember these rhododendrons. They were like mountains. They were way out to here. You've cut them back a lot. We have cut them back. You can see that these ones, that we cut them back quite a long way. Yes. So you can really cut them down to sort of knee high and then let them shoot again. You can. As a general rule, the, yeah. the rough and flaky bark uh, 
rhododendrons will respond well to a, a hard prune, whereas the smooth bark ones tend to take a little bit more care. Yeah, but they will respond. But they do respond. Yeah, That's don't, right. Don't you know? Don't think you can't prune a rhododendron. No, no, definitely. Look at that. Yeah, they, and this is what what you get rewarded with is this lovely metallic new growth at the start of the season. Lace bug is a common problem on the back of the rhododendron leaves. What do you, how do you cope? What sort of processes have you got? Um, well, it's a long-term approach, essentially. Um, once upon a time, we would have just done broad-spectrum insecticide. Mm. Um, we've tried to move away from that to a much more holistic approach. We're planting things like rosemary and mint and salvias and penstemons, trying to encourage bug diversity yep. with plant diversity. Yes, and so that they'll go and hopefully get rid of the, the lace bug. Yeah, that's right. You're encouraging your predator your predator bugs mm. for the pest bugs. And it's working okay? Look, I think so, yeah. Look, it's, as I said, it's a long-term strategy. It's a big garden, but it's something that will, over time, improve and improve. Mm. These are different kinds of rhododendrons, interestingly. Yes, they are. So these are the Varea group mm. of rhododendrons. So they're more, much more equatorial, so a lot of the... Asiatic sort of rhododendrons and European ones, all northern hemisphere. These ones grow around the equator in places like New Guinea yep. and Solomon Islands, Malaysia, but way up in the mountain tops. Now I noticed one up here is a beauty. It is a beauty. That's a must have uh, varia for, for any home garden. That's a rhododendron tuba with the great white flowers with mm. the long trumpets. Unusual. Up in the nursery, there are some young examples of an Australian Viraya. So here, Jane, we have uh, Australia's very own rhododendron Lockyeye. So these were collected from the mountaintops up in northern Queensland, mm. so from the wet tropics, but up in high altitudes, above about 950 metres. Oh, they, so they, they come from. They can really take quite cold. They can't can. They? So they're actually quite well climate matched to here down in the mountains in Victoria. So the area that these grow in. That's quite a vulnerable area. It is a vulnerable area. You think about the mountaintops up in the wet tropics, really subjected to the impact of climate change. These plants are as high as they possibly can go, and they can't go any higher to find any cooler weather, so really um, under threat. These are here as a backup to the wild populations. Each mountaintop is represented here. So heaven forbid we ever need it, we have a backup in ex situ conservation collections. Oh, that's really good. So you'll plant these out into the garden? They will be. We'll propagate from these. They'll, they'll be planted out in the garden, but they'll also be distributed amongst other botanic gardens around Australia as well. So you've got that true genetic diversity? True genetic diversity, yes. We are so lucky to have gardens like this, places that are safe to noon, Walking around a spectacular garden like this is surely good for your soul. Is an avocado a fruit or a vegetable? Well, this delicious avocado is a fruit. And botanically speaking, it's a large berry, which is quite exceptional because other berries seed spread very easily by animals eating them and releasing it in their dung. There are no animals big enough to spread the avocado seed that way. Certainly not around here anyway. So scientists believe that they co-evolved with prehistoric megafauna that could eat the fruit whole. Now the megafauna are extinct, but the avocados still around. So think of that next time you're spreading some on your toast. How do I know if my plant's established? When you're reading plant descriptions, often it says something like hardy and water-wise once established. And that basically means that the plant's root system has settled into your soil after you've planted it. And after a short period of time, it's able to survive and thrive without you giving it too much attention. So ultimately it depends where you live and what the plant is, but it's about choosing the right plant for your climate and then letting it cope with very little attention. Can you compost tea bags? That's a good question. You can for some, but these days a lot of tea bags contain microplastics and polypropylene to help them hold their form and to seal them. So 
Really, the only way you're going to find out is if you contact the company and see whether they do contain it. The other way I do it is to do a little bit of my own citizen science and put them in my worm farm because if the worms don't touch it, you know that there's plastic in there. But, you know, for me, the best option is to go with tea leaves. Put them into a cup infuser or a teapot and actually free the leaf. Let it express itself and infuse all that beautiful flavour. And what's better than a future with a little less plastic in our lives, particularly our tea? Cheers. I want to show you my little tomato system, which I use every year. So, of course, I raise my own seed. Had a bit of erratic germination this year. It was really cold. So what's remaining is really precious, and I want to make sure it gets potted into a bigger pot and we'll nurture it right up until it goes into the ground. I use a really simple system. It's paper pots. I make them. If you want to see how to do that, just jump onto the website. And really importantly, mark the variety. It's important not to grab them by those new leaves. You don't want to damage them and also not to grab them by the stem. And then just carefully over into the pot. Tomatoes will actually form roots up their stems. And so I can plant them about halfway up. So keep them really stable in the pot, but also mean that they're going to form extra roots. I'm going to treat these very, very well. They are precious little plants to me. So I'm going to keep these really moist for about three to four weeks and then they will be itching to get into the ground. You'll see that the roots will actually start to grow out of the base of these paper pots, which means they can go into the ground, in the pots, and you won't get any transplant shock. It's a simple little system, but there are so many delicious rewards. Whether you're a curved creative type or a gardener that stays on the straight and narrow, defining your garden beds is one of the simplest ways you can make a statement. There's so many ways you can do it. And Tino's got the tips to give your garden the edge. Designing and creating new garden beds is always fun, but with a bit of preparation and planning, the home gardener can make the most of a space and turn it into something a bit special. One way of doing this is through the use of landscape edging. Edging garden beds accentuates different parts of your garden, creating rooms, islands and voids. It's a great way of tying spaces together, making them feel a little bit neater, crisper and well managed. You might want to go organic with wood, or a bit industrial with rusty steel, or something more earthy like stone or brick. There are plenty of prefab options also, including recycled plastics. There are loads of fantastic ways to give your garden the edge without breaking the bank. A spade edge is exactly what it sounds like. It's an edge created between the turf and the garden bed using nothing but a spade and my muscles. If you're creating a new bed, use some marker paint or even a garden hose to make the outline of the edge. Using a sharp, square spade, face the garden bed and slice into the turf until you've outlined the entire bed. You're aiming for a nice, straight slice down, about 10 centimetres deep. Ideally, at a 90 degree angle, into the turf at a 45 degree angle to sever the grass. The V-shaped trench stops the spread of soil, seed and mulch onto your lawn. It also slows down the creep of your lawn into your garden bed. It's probably the easiest garden edge you can make and it's especially effective against grass species like Kokuyu because their roots won't grow into air and they won't cross the void. Another thing about spade edges is you can expand them as your garden bed grows. Plus, they don't cost a thing and they look brilliant. But they're not maintenance free. They'll need to be tidied up and redefined every six months or so. A great job to schedule for spring and again for autumn. I may also need some hand trimming or brush cutting 
to keep turf crisp and neat along the edges. But if this isn't your thing, maybe the next option is for you. A variation on the spade edge is the mowing strip, a narrow row of pavers or bricks separating a garden bed from a lawn. When mowing the grass, you run one side of your mower right on top of the mowing strip, eliminating the need for brush cutting and preventing the mower from making a meal of your precious plants. Mowing strips are dead easy to install. You've all got access to old bricks or pavers. If you can't find any, check your back garden shed or try your local tip shop. I've even seen these strips made out of old scraps of hardwood. I'm gonna create a strip between the old convict wall and the concrete curb here to keep the grass out of the garden bed. They don't have to be big. They only need to be wide enough for your mold wheel to fit onto. And you're good to go. First, clean up the area. Then measure the bricks and mark the inside and the outside of the garden edge. And get slicing with your square spade. It's the same process as the spade edge, but instead of an angle trench, we want a squared off space for our bricks to slot snugly. A good way to ensure consistent depth with your slicing is to whack a piece of masking tape onto the face and the rear of the shovel. This is an easy visual that tells you how deep you can dig your trench. You can compact the floor of the trench using a brick, a boot, or a block of wood. But remember, we want the bricks to sit level or just higher than the surrounding turf. I'm gonna plonk in some sand, or you could use compacted road base, but it's not essential. And in the string line or a spirit level to help you, and then fill the gaps in with sand. So why don't you grab some tools, get busy, and get a bit edgy in your garden. It's easy, it looks great, and it'll save you loads of work on maintenance down the track. As gardeners, I think it's a given that we all have a dream of packing up, heading for the hills, and setting up the simple life. But how many of us actually do it? Well, Josh has found a family they didn't just dream, they've made it a reality. We were very inspired by a TV program called The Good Life and thought that we'd move from the city and give it a crack in the hills, that we'd be self-sufficient, we'd grow all our own fruit, vegetables and have plenty of space to rear a young family. Mixing a bit of self-sufficiency with a rural lifestyle without being too far from the big smoke. It's a pipe dream for many of us. But that's just what Robin Longley and husband John set out to do 40 years ago on 10 hectares in the Darling Ranges. Yes, yes, we built the house. It's built out of recycled materials, which was not very common 40 years ago, so recycled materials were very, very cheap. John was working as an engineer, and so he loves earthworks, he loves brick paving, he loves building rock walls. Um, I'm the gardener and he's the construction manager. This garden's beautifully established. Were there challenges? The main challenge was that where it's built on rock. We often have to get a local rock breaker in to dig holes when I want to plant trees. We have a limited water supply and the soil is not terribly fertile so I've had to dig in a lot of compost and animal manure over the years. The dappled shade created by the trees planted around the house has created a comfortable microclimate and dense understory plantings of hardy flowering shrubs fill the garden with colour and fragrance. Salvias are a favourite and are a magnet for bees. Now to the productive part of the garden. So I've just taken all the winter veggies out and I grow mainly eggplant. I grow a lot of chilies to make chilli sauce, tomatoes, quite a lot of herbs, basil for making pesto, just summer vegetables. Shade's important. Sh shade's important. I think it's full sun. 
best of the year. Any growing tips? Blueberry is like a really acid environment and it's much easier to control that when you grow them in pots. They're like a really heavy mulch because they have very fine surface roots. I fertilise with a, just a slow release all-purpose fertiliser and then when they're at the height of production I give them a, a little side dose of sulphate of ammonia and sulphate of potash. Jess, what's it been like growing up with this lifestyle? I feel very fortunate to have grown up this way. I mean, I, I know where food comes from. I know what food is in season, the work that goes into producing it. So, It's really become a thing, hasn't it? Growing food and preparing it in a way that's really good for us. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people are really wanting to go back to basics and know where their food has come from, how it's been processed, and you know, enjoy the satisfaction of having something on the shelf that they've made themselves. Robin, you set out all those years ago to try and live a more self-reliant lifestyle. Do you think you've achieved that? Um, we certainly produce a lot of food. I don't know about the whole self-sufficiency thing. That's trickier than it looks. But I think what I have achieved is creating a very tranquil sort of garden that is a lovely escape from the busy life that most of us lead. Imagine a tropical rainforest, your picture a warm, humid climate with tall trees, thick vegetation, and a significant tree canopy. But here in southeastern Queensland, we do rainforests of an entire Dry rainforests have similarities with tropical ones, in that you'll find vines and epiphytes like orchids and ferns, but the tree canopies are much lighter, and as a the forest floor can get much more sunlight. Kambacho Sanctuary and Nursery is home to such a dry rainforest, and as our climate warms and dries, the plants that live in this habitat are ideally suited to the stresses and strains of home gardens and public open spaces. And leading the push to get these native plants out into the community is manager Irene Wood. So what does Kambacho do? We propagate over 250 species of local rainforest and other species here. It's a wide range but we, we supply to a number of places all around Australia. And, and what are the sort of uses for, for the plants? Um, a lot of plants go into revegetation work um, for home gardens. They're very suitable for home garden, much, much underused. So a lot of the things you grow you wouldn't find in a main Garden Absolutely not. And what sort of species do you do you try to, to gather and share? Everything, everything from your agrodendons, your bouillons, to anything. I, I just love seeds. I like anything I can find. So, so there's a there's an experimental nature to what you do. Highly experimental at times. Yeah, yeah. We use all different sorts of methods to try and get them to to, to germinate. These plants aren't much used in cultivation, and aren't that easy to find, which makes propagating them essential. Irene and her team have been cracking the codes needed to do just that. So the plant they're sowing here is a Melostoma malbacriatum, or blue tongue by its common name. They're a really important little plant, 
and they're really important to us because there's a weed species that is very similar to this. But you do see these sold in garden centres, don't you? But it's not the same. It's not the same. This is the true species. This is the one that grows locally. It is not weed. The one you see in garden centres come from China in most instances. So this, this one we've had identified by the herbarium, as we have most of our plants here identified by the herbarium when they come in for the first time, so that we are absolutely sure that people are getting what we say they are, and it's the right species for the right place. Authentic. Authentic, yeah. This is one of my favourites, the little Corrigon, Brachychite and Bidwilli eye. And I, I just noticed as that went into the pot, they have really chunky stems, don't they? These would make a really good car park oh, tree lovely. because they're very narrow, easily trained, and they flower on the stems. Yeah, and they're very pretty. This is one of the oldest trees in the sanctuary. It's been here for quite some time. This is a foam bark tree. It is it? a foam bark tree. It's called a foam bark because after rain, foam actually forms on the trunk of the tree. Then it falls to the ground and provides a wetting agent. It's a so fantastic it's... adaptation to a, a, a sudden downpour of rain, isn't it? Absolutely recommend people grow these as an alternative to European ash. Yeah, ab absolutely. And for this environment, it's really good for the birds. The birds come and feed off it fairly regularly. How easy are they to grow from seed? From seed, they're quite simple to grow, but there's a couple of techniques. You need to make sure that you're wearing gloves. The seed pods have a layer of fibres on them, which are quite damaging to your fingers. They, they sting, and if they get in, you cause you a lot of problems. So this is the Tachima tenax, the pitted steel wood, a very handy tree in revegetation. Now this can be clipped and trimmed and shaped into a hedge. So Absolutely. It can be used very successfully in hedging in the garden. It can be nice and compact. It's a bit different to your usual suspects, your lily pillies and your mock oranges. And the other benefit with it is the fact that with all the allergies around at the moment, and mock orange is one that particularly aggravates allergies, this is a good so it's not going to help inflame any sort of nasal or chest infections or anything like that. And really drought hardy too. Very drought hardy. It's a great garden tree. Great garden tree. All of these dry rainforest species have a place in the garden. They've adapted to a drying climate and they can cope with local soils and conditions. While some of these are not common in ordinary garden centres, that means chicken out your local native nursery even more exciting. Still to come on Gardening Australia. I'm heading to a unique community farm growing a productive future for some underused land. Clarence is getting serious about controlling a stinky citrus pest. And we head to far north Queensland where everything is big, including one gardener's passion for plants. Those of you with small children don't really need me to tell you that this weekend is Halloween. The event celebrates one vegetable, the good old pumpkin. And now is the time to be planting it. And who better to help you than our very own pumpkin pro, Sophie. One of the success stories had about 35 different varieties of pumpkins after the last frost in November, and they take off. You can't actually see what's growing particularly well because they all tangle together and they're clamouring all over my citrus shelters, but I'm going to get an amazing harvest. Pumpkins need 100 frost-free days, so that's a long growing period compared to other vegetables. I move the pumpkin patch around in all these different beds every year, so they never grow in the same bed two years in a row. And the secret really is to find a nice sunny position with good air circulation and the best soil you can get, because these are definitely hungry vegetables. I've got a big pumpkin patch here at my property because I've got space for the larger varieties to grow. However, there are plenty of compact varieties that suit smaller gardens. This one is called Golden Nugget and there's another variety I love called Bushfire. They can either be grown as a low trailer, they can be grown up a tripod or even on a low trellis. I prepare the soil three to six months in advance 
using the chook manure and hay out of our chook yard. And by the time I'm ready to plant in mid to late spring, the soil is fabulous. Once planted, they need to be watered regularly. In my hot summer dry climate, if I wet the foliage, it's not a problem because within five minutes, it will have dried out. However, if you live in an area with summer humidity, try to avoid getting the foliage wet or you'll end up with powdery mildew during the growing season. When powdery mildew has taken hold and the plants have had their day, the old plants can be added to a hot compost. The fungus doesn't tolerate the conditions. You can harvest pumpkins whenever they sound hollow and you tap them. However, because I like to store my pumpkins in my cellar, where they can last for up to 15 months, different varieties last different periods of time, I like to leave them on the vine for as long as possible to harden off. I wait till the vines have died off, and usually that's around the time of my first frost in mid-May. Whenever I cut a pumpkin, always make sure you cut a bit of the stem, and that means that the plant won't rot and it will last better. This one's ready for dinner tonight. So a successful pumpkin crop needs plenty of space to grow. Full sun, good air circulation, amazing soil with lots of compost, regular watering and plenty of time. But the rewards are definitely worth it. <laughs> This isn't any old market garden. It's a thriving business enterprise run in a really innovative way. I'm at Millen Farm on the outskirts of suburban Brisbane. Six years ago, this half hectare of land was no longer wanted by the CSIRO for cattle research. So it was up for grabs. I think this is a perfect example of how a community organisation uh, can instigate change, not only local level but on a state and a federal level you know they've all got together here and they've chipped in four and a half million dollars they're building a community hub uh, and they're getting the uh, infrastructure all sorted out here so uh, yeah it's amazing for us Aaron Heidemann works for and is part of the community group that now operates from the site where some of the old CSIRO infrastructure is being removed it's about 5,000 square meters and inside that 5,000 square meters we've got 65 rows under production and each lock rotates around itself so it's a rotation system within each alphabetical block yeah no two crops follow each other uh, so we look at it in terms of uh, short-term crops and long-term crops we get two lots of uh, asian greens going through for one lot of uh, beetroot it sort of works that way even though this is large scale like any community garden volunteer gardeners are all important and volunteering comes highly recommended. Great to be here. And I'm learning off Aaron. You're giving back to the community. It's the best feeling ever. I'm in my element. What more can I say? Look at this place. Millen Farm is run on permaculture principles. So composting and worm farming are integral to soil health and plant nutrition. And swales run across the sloping site to slow and trap water. We've got the big main swale at the top of the hill, which controls all of the stormwater that hits the farm. Uh, but then each bed is itself its own swale, um, stopping nutrients, slowing and stopping water as much as possible, but holding that nutrient in, really looking after the soil biology is, is the number one key here on site. Usually when you visit a market garden, the rows are packed in tight, but here there's heaps of room between them. The reason why we did this is not only so that uh, when volunteers or people from the public come to the farm, they know where to walk, not on the bears, on the, on the grass paths, but also uh, the added effect of when the grass grows up a little bit, it gets all the flowers and things like that. It's really adding another biodiversity row, bringing in those beneficial bugs. Local native species are playing an important role here in the border planting. We've got a westerly wind putting this blockage in, um, stops the wind, creates the turbulence, stops the frost from rising up, but also creates that beneficial habitat that we really need for a farm out in an exposed site. Aaron's used several pioneer species in the windbreak, things that'll grow quickly on a new open site like wattles. 
the brown currajong has really powered away, reaching around four metres in just two years. Casuarina cunninghamiana has vigorous mat-like roots and readily sheds its needle-shaped leaves, helping to smother weed competition, while the cheese tree shades out the weeds with its dense canopy of dark green leathery foliage. And the Lamandra is doing more than just forming a border. It's really creating a barrier and stopping all those weed seeds from blowing in into uh, underneath all these tree species that we really don't want to have to weed out. The garden is growing a feeling of positivity for everyone involved in Mill and Farm. But what outcomes are being achieved? We've started our very own farmer's market, so we recoup some of the money that we've invested in the farm uh, through that farmer's market. We've teamed up with uh, a training organisation uh, and we put on a conservation and land management certificate one course and also a construction certificate one course on the farm. Uh, so we've put through 90 students now between the two courses and I think there's only two students that uh, have a job so far, but it's really, really fantastic for the, the students to come on board, get their hands dirty uh, and turn their lives around. We're only at the very, very start of what's going to be a very, very, very interesting and very cool time here at Millen Farm. There's nothing quite like the fresh, juicy taste of homegrown citrus. Quite sublime. And whether it is lime, lemon or grapefruit, if you're growing citrus, there's a chance you could have stink bugs and you can smell them from a mile away. Stink bugs are flat-bodied insects, so-called because of the vile odour of the caustic secretion they release when disturbed. Oh yeah, that's the smell. Oh. Adult stink bugs can reach two and a half centimetres in length. These bugs can do a lot of damage to your citrus trees as they suck sap from new shoots and flower stems, causing shoots to wither and before you know it, you've lost your crop. You're sucking the sap out, you can actually see it secreting out from where that fruit is uh, joined onto the little suckers. Well, there are a heap of organic sprays on the market, but they're really not that effective. The simplest and easiest way is physical removal. I don't have a 200 metre cord for my vacuum cleaner, otherwise I'd use that into the bag, into the bin, gone. Instead, I've come prepared. And I've got these stunning looking safety goggles, so I don't want the secretions to get into my eyes. And if I've got sensitive skin, I certainly don't want them to squirt onto my hands and onto my arms. I've also come prepared with a bucket of detergent. And we're gonna take these little guys for a little swim. And the tricky part about this is that the closer you get, the more you upset them, the more they secrete their stink. So I really don't want that to happen too much. I just grab hold of the branch and we just put it down into the soapy water. Off they come. The only problem with this method, of course, is that uh, quite often the branches are up high. But we try our best, give it a nice shake. We might lose a bit of our fruit, but it's better than the alternative. And again, uh, he doesn't want to come off, he's stuck, and he stinks. But there we go. If he gets too much trouble, then you've got to resort to the old-fashioned method of just, thank you for coming. Good night, Irene. Hopefully all the adult stink bugs have been taken off this tree. If not, we can come back and check a bit later on. In the uh, meantime, during the summer months, check under your leaves. See if you've got any eggs. If there's any eggs, just take off a leaf, pop it in the bin, and that'll stop the cycle from reoccurring. But just keep a regular watch on them. If you want to keep your citrus, get rid of your stink bugs. For most of us, travel is something we haven't been able to do a lot of this year. But each week, we do our best to bring you plants and gardens from all over the country from the cool temperate climate of Tassie 
to our friends in the west and this week all the way to the tropical north. I hope this next garden has you thinking warm thoughts. My name is Matt Mitchley and I'm a collector. I collect Art Deco furniture. I collect wonderful and weird species of fish. And by day, I'm a landscape gardener. I also have a wholesale nursery. That keeps me busy for most of the time, but I do have some big plans for the future. I always see myself surrounded by nature and there's no better place to do this than in Cairns. I call this place a greenhouse in Australia. So I've always had a fascination with dinosaurs and with all things prehistoric. My collection is full of Asian plants, Asian looking plants as well, and plants that have the theme of the Jurassic era. Some of the, uh, the ponytail, palms, the yuccas and the dracaenas, they all have that nice big leaf structure that really does look like it's from that sort of time. My favorite plants have to be the ones with the most biggest leaves and the ones that look the most Jurassic, which are, I would say are the Dracaena. This is a Dracaena cochinchinensis, it's from China. Uh, Dracaenas are all over the world, in deserts and in, in the tropics. One of the world's most indoor species, because um, they're so easy maintenance and easy care, but put them in the ground in the tropics and they go crazy. The patterns on the trunk are, are made by the leaves. Um, each leaf that leaves the trunk, it puts an imprint onto the um, trunk of the tree. I planted this um, plant as a um, mazayun plant, to half a meter high, and it's probably been 10 years. So in the last 10 years, it's grown, it's grown this much. Could have another 100 years of growth. Yeah, so it's a very long lived plant. Some of them live to 1,000 years. These guys are out at night time, so they just wanted to go to bed, I think. These are Australia's most protected fish. These are the Queensland lungfish. They have no reason to further evolve because they're very happy in their life and very happy with the situation that they're in. They're good examples of, of the animals that lived back in the time, in the prehistoric time, 150 million years ago. I've tried to, um, to bring a part of nature into our living space. Kids are so um, disconnected from nature at the moment. So our grand plan is for my daughter Summer to, um, to have access to all the plants, all the animals, to recognize them and to be close to them. I have a colony of magnificent tree frogs. These are from the Kimberleys in Western Australia. In the wild, they live in caves, and um, in very hot and humid caves. So I've tried to, to replicate that environment. And I've got a python as well and a bearded dragon. I've got blue tongue lizards. The blue tongues have been there for 10 years. They're very happy, uh, very little maintenance. This is the um, edible pandanus. It is, um, it's, a, it's a great aquatic species that I might use to remove as much uh, of the nitrates out of the water as possible. It makes the water very clean. All the nutrients that live in the water being sucked up. It means better quality water and it means less fish waste. These guys are the, uh, the most prolific growers and I, I give them a prune back every four weeks. After starting my landscape business, I used to go down to the green waste tip and I saw so many plants that I could reuse. I went there one day and I saw a cycad that was just chopped up in the ground, so I thought if there's a way of me saving one of these plants, um, I'll be very happy to. So for the next few years, I ran ads in the local newspaper offering free removal for unwanted plants. And after five years of this happening, I started to run out of space in my own, in my own garden, so I, I had to find another place for them to go. I was able to get a five years lease on a piece of land not far from my house. Um, and I've been able to create a the Jurassic theme garden on a much bigger scale. It's just at an age now that I'm really happy with it. The 
like where the plants are now, um, it was just sand. So the first challenge was to bring in soil. So 500 cubic meters of, of soil came in. The next challenge was um, to condition the soil. So trucks and trucks and trucks of green waste mulch was brought in to the site. It was a bit of excavation work and then the plants came in. Uh, some of them were giant plants that we had to crane in and heaps of them was brought in by machine. This is a Pacopodium lamari. It's about 15 years old and it's from Madagascar. The armory on this on this plant is very impressive. Um, obviously it was designed to stop an animal from, from climbing up. If they're in a place that has very little water in the, in the dry season in the tropics, their leaves are very well needed in, in the environment for them to photosynthesize. Can you imagine being a monkey and, uh, and trying to climb this tree? It's, it would be pretty impossible, I think. Because I've always been trying to create the drastic look, it was a nice feeling when a lady said to me that her, her daughter had driven by and she wanted to see the dinosaurs that were inside the park. That was great, but that was a really good time to, um, to actually hear that it was actually working. The Brandii, and they are from Madagascar, and they're actually extinct in the wild. Uh, the most impressive thing about these guys is the fact that five years ago there were only seedlings. So in the last five years they've grown this much. They're bottle trees, um, so they absorb as much water as they possibly can for them to survive the dry season. In Cairns, they get water all year round, which means that they can continue to grow. So this is the reason why we have them so big so soon. Most people's gardens now are too small to have these in, but if, if you have a lot of land, then it would be amazing to have these plants in your garden. Everything's gone crazy and everything's grown and bloomed and, and um, it is now the prospect of us moving this property. It's, it's quite a daunting process that we have to take. We have a year on this lease and um, for the last five years I've searched very hard to find a bigger location that has good soil. It's, it's also in Cairns. So only up the road, only seven kilometres away, we just acquired a new property. It's a block of land that I would, I would like to consolidate all of my house, my garden, that wholesale nursery and bring it all into one place. The dream is to construct a huge Jurassic theme park. I don't want to tell you what to do in your garden because that's your creative space. But if you could use a few ideas, get ready, because here they come. cool temperate gardens it's finally tomato time for months of salads salsas and soups so a mix of early mid and late season toms this will extend your harvest and avoid gluts periwinkle vinca major is common in gardens but it's also a common weed of bushland and waterways get it out and replace it with a non-invasive native like hardened berger as roses rocket into their spring growth period, keep an eye out for aphids on young buds and new growth. Give them a squish if you see them, or carefully spray with horticultural oil. Warm temperate gardeners, irises are flowering and looking fantastic now. With over 300,000 cultivars available, these old-fashioned faves are as collectible as they are colourful. Adding some organic soil wetter to hydrophobic soils and pastured potting mixes can help water penetrate and reach the roots. Buy it off the shelf or make your own using agar agar. Strike some simple softwood cuttings of salvias, rosemary, mint leaves. Pot up and you'll have new plants in no time. In the subtropics, pop in a Jap pumpkin, perfect for this climate. In a sunny spot, sow seeds direct into a mound of compost-rich soil, add a handful of dolomite lime and water well. Climbing plants are growing like bilio and will benefit from having top growth trained horizontally. This encourages new shoots to grow vertically, filling out fences and fronts. The 
ravishing rondelicia are finishing up their stunning spring show. To keep them neat and boost next season's blooms, prune flowering stems back to within a few nodes of old growth. In the tropics, planting heliconias now means they get a big beautiful boost from the impending wet. Fertilise regularly and you'll have fantastic flowers in a few months. It's time to pick pineapples, the world's tastiest bromeliad. Tap the side of ripening fruit. If it sounds solid, it's ready to harvest. Replant the top and you'll get another fruit in 18 months. Need more herbs in the burbs and spice in your life? Try these tasty tropicals. Five in one herb, beetle leaf, cloves, curry leaf, galangal, pepper, turmeric, Vietnamese coriander and mint. Arid Gardener's Kangaroo Board finish flowering. So pop on the gloves and glasses, roll down the sleeves and remove spent flowers by cutting stems off at the base. Good looking, tough and tasty, find a sheltered spot and pop in some nasturtiums. Foliage and flowers add a spicy zing to salads and pods, once brined, are a cracking caper substitute. If you've got access to irrigation, grow an excellent eggplant or two. Great in the patch or pots, try varieties like Black Beauty, Turkish Orange or Takaniki that don't hate the heat. Have a ripper weekend, gardeners, and don't forget to check out our Gardening Australia YouTube channel for heaps of tips, tricks and great gardening advice. Before we go, I just want to talk to you about a recent initiative called Audio Description. Some of you may have noticed over the last little while an extra voice on our programs. Let me demonstrate. Costa waves to the camera. Costa walks off screen. Costa walks back in with a flower and smells it. Did you hear that? Well, if you have the AD setting of your TV on, you would have been hearing that voice during the program. That voice describes what's happening or could benefit from it. Let them know about it. And if you don't need the service, then simply turn it off. You'll find all the details on our website. I can't wait to see you next week. You know where to find me. I'll see you here in the garden. NADOC week starts on Sunday. So to kick it off, we're catching up with elder, educator and scientist Fran Bodkin to hear about her life with plants. I'll be sharing some of what I know about one of the most useful plant families on the planet, the myrtle moth. Well, scientifically speaking, the family Myrtaceae. And if tomatoes have been your summer love for the last few years, don't you think it's time to meet the rest of the family? I'm going to be inviting more members of the Solanaceae family into my summer patch. <laughs>